Welcome back to the Book of Acts as we continue to do a virtual tour. As I said before, this is going to be the 500 mile an hour, 30,000 foot flyover of the book. And it's really going to be a survey, a virtual tour that's going to take you through the historical, geographical, cultural, and archaeological evidence that will really enrich your reading of this book. Let's get started in Acts chapter 1. We're in Jerusalem, and we're on the Mount Olivet. This is a picture here from where the disciples would have been standing. You can see the Dome of the Rock there, and this is what is remaining of the Temple of Jerusalem. At this point, the disciples are with Jesus. They've been with him for 40 days, and he ascends into heaven. He goes into the clouds, which this, of course, was literal. I mean, this was historical, but this, of course, is also symbolic that he went to go be with God because God usually appears as a cloud, for example, in the Exodus. And a couple of angels talk to the men as they're looking up into the sky and they say, why do you keep looking into the sky? He's going to return in exactly the same way that he left. And so uh, Jesus' second coming, he's going to land at Mount Olivet. It's going to be a literal second coming. Uh, Zechariah chapter 14 tells us. At this point, we go to Acts chapter 2. I'm not sure what you think about that painting there. I'm not sure what I think about it. The language of Acts chapter 2 says that there were tongues of fire, but it uses the language of simile, tongues as a fire. It says that there was a sound like a rushing wind that came through the house in which they were staying. Uh, This is phenomenal language. Basically, they're trying to describe this incredible event at Pentecost. This is where the Holy Spirit comes into the lives and into the, the people who were believers in Jesus. What's really essential here is that all of these people from across the world are entering back to Jerusalem to celebrate the festival of Pentecost. And while they're there, they get more than they asked for. We see that these people actually come to meet Christ. Peter gives an incredible teaching. 3,000 people come to Christ. People start to meet in homes and at the temple where the apostles are teaching. They're uh, breaking bread. They're sharing things in common. And the most primitive Christianity, we see that they're doing what we're doing today. Uh, Praying, reading the Bible, and uh, building friendships together as they grow with God. In Acts chapters 3 and 4, we see that Peter and John, they heal a man who is physically handicapped. This occurs in the temple at Solomon's portico. Here's a recreation in Jerusalem today. This is actually an acre in size that somebody recreated a model of Solomon's portico. And there's the eastern wall. Uh, In a great test of leadership, when the people come to Peter, Peter actually defers and shows the glory to God. He says in Acts, is it 3.13, you know, why are you looking to us as if by our, by our own piety or power we could have healed this man? So instead of taking the glory for himself, he, he deflects the glory back onto God. By the end of chapter 4, we meet a very important person who comes up in the book of Acts in particular and the New Testament in general. I'm speaking, of course, of the son of encouragement, Barnabas, who sells his beachfront property in Cyprus to help meet the needs of the poor in Jerusalem. This is in stark contrast to Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. You see, Barnabas was giving his money just out of the, the cheerfulness of his heart. You know, 2 Corinthians 8, Ananias and Sapphira were giving to have some kind of religious prestige. This was hypocritical this was phony, and God made a statement by judging these two people. Basically, he was trying to show that they were to be different than the surrounding you know, Pharisees and uh, the common Jewish religion, which had turned into hypocrisy. In Acts chapter 6, we see another schism. So in case you think your church has problems, the early church had problems as well. Hypocrisy and also favoritism. You see, there were the Hebraic Jewish widows who believed in Jesus, and then there were the Hellenistic Jewish widows who believed in Jesus. And these Hellenistic Jews, these were those who kind of compromised to the culture. You know, they spoke Greek, they read the Septuagint, which was a a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, 
and they also were were uh, looser, I guess you could say, with Greek culture. Meanwhile, the Hebraic Jews were more conservative. Uh, they spoke Aramaic, they read the Bible in Hebrew, and so they kind of viewed the Hellenistic Jews as kind of like a, a second-class Jews, so to speak. And they were favoring the Hebraic Jewish widows over the Hellenistic widows when they were giving out the food. And this became a real you know, point of contention. Well, the apostles solved this by uh, picking seven Greek Christian leaders to pass out the food and kind of adjudicate who should get the food to be impartial, to be fair. Two of these were uh, Philip, who will come up later, and also uh, Stephen, who comes up in Acts chapter 7. Now, Stephen is an incredibly interesting figure. He not only was a, a servant, you know, it wasn't beneath him to serve the tables of widows, but he was also an incredible intellectual, a debater, an incredible speaker, and really a visionary. We see in, in Stephen's defense, he is really arguing that the locus of spirituality isn't in Jerusalem. But instead, God in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, he constantly was working outside of Israel. So his, basically, to put it this kind of simply, Stephen was arguing that God doesn't want to work through holy spaces or places or races. And so he argues, you know, where did, where did God appear to Abraham? Well, he appeared in Ur of the Chaldees. Uh, where did he call a holy place at the burning bush? In Midian, outside of Israel. Where did he work all those you know, miracles and wonders? In Egypt, outside of Israel. And basically his argument is this, that God is working outside of Israel, and he's going to do that to a large extent today. As I said, he was an incredible visionary, and this would have been a stunning shock to the Christian movement at the time because they would have been losing one of their best leaders, you know, an intellectual, a servant, a visionary, someone who really got it, you know, someone who could really see that Jesus' message of love and forgiveness wasn't just for the Jewish people, but it was for everybody. And he was stoned to death and martyred. Well, out of the ashes of that tragedy, we see that there was a young man who was listening to this entire speech, a young man named Saul of Tarsus, Saul of Tarsus, who later becomes Paul, the apostle, who writes 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament. And he was soaking up Stephen's entire speech. Now, there's no inclination to think that Saul believed any of it. Uh, it says in Acts chapter 8 that he became a persecutor of the church. And yet we know he was listening because in Acts chapter 17, he says that God does not dwell in temples made by human hands, which is right out of Stephen's speech in Acts chapter 7. So whereas one person was taken out of the picture, another one is in the forefront of our minds as the story unfolds. Well, from here, we see that persecution strikes the church. So whereas before there was internal schisms and problems and hypocrisy, here we see that the external problems really get ramped up. And God uses this. You see that the Jewish people would have been perfectly content just to stay in Jerusalem in their comfort. And yet God somehow uses the persecution of Saul, the persecutor, ravening, uh, ravaging the church to actually push these people out of their comfort into Samaria. I mean, if you know anything about the tension between the, the Jews and the Samaritans, they hated each other. The Samaritans were considered half-breeds of you know, Jews and, and Assyrians, and they would have never moved up into Samaria if it wasn't for this persecution. Well, while all of this is happening, an angel speaks to Philip, and he tells him to go down to a desert road in Gaza. Now, this would be just totally peculiar. Imagine being Philip at that time. You know, everything's happening in Jerusalem. People are fleeing to Samaria, and you're telling me to go out into the desert. Well, he listens. He goes out into the desert, and he meets an Ethiopian eunuch. This man seems to be pretty rich. He represents the royalty in Ethiopia. He makes his travel in a chariot, and he also has a copy of the uh, Hebrew scrolls, at least one of them. Well, the Holy Spirit tells Philip to ride up next to the chariot and speak to this man, and he looks in and he sees that this Ethiopian man is reading a scroll. 
And just like today, if you know you're in a Starbucks or something and you saw somebody reading a book, he'd say, "Hey, what are you reading?" You know. So Philip asks, "You know, what are you reading?" And the Ethiopian eunuch says, "Well, I'm reading Isaiah 53." And so one of the greatest prophecies of Jesus, this man is reading. And so Philip explains what this prophecy is, and eventually the Ethiopian eunuch comes to faith in Jesus. He's baptized. And at that moment, uh, Philip is taken. He's snatched. The word here is harpazo. It's the word used of Paul being snatched up into the third heaven in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, or the church being rescued, harpazo. They're snatched up by Jesus in 1 Thessalonians 4. So he's somehow moved, taken, snatched, and then eventually he travels up to Caesarea and there he stays for about 20 years. We don't see him again until Acts chapter 21. Apparently, he laid down some roots and had a family. We pick up in Acts 21 with him and his four daughters, who were all Christians and prophetesses. This is where the book of Acts has a real central message, a central story with Saul. Up until this point, Saul, everything in his life was going well. He was ravaging the church. He was persecuting the church. And so he decides that he's going to go up to Damascus. You see, Saul was a visionary. He could see that this message of this sect of Judaism, this you know cult group that had split off of traditional Judaism, it had already made its way up into Samaria. And he figured it was probably going to continue to you know, spread out up into Galilee and the rest of Judea. And so... This bleeding movement that was spreading out, you know, Paul wanted to tie a tourniquet on this movement up in Damascus. So he travels over 100 miles up here to kind of cut off the movement. And what's interesting is that Saul goes to Damascus to stop Christianity, but Christ goes to Damascus to stop Saul. And Christ wins this encounter. He appears to him in an incredible way. Uh, transfigured state. You know, the light is brighter than the sun at noonday. Uh, Paul's co-travelers just hit the deck. They hear a booming voice. Uh, they're probably plugging their ears, averting their eyes. They don't want to look at this. But Saul must have looked up as he hears this voice. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul looks right up into the eyes of none other than Jesus. And Jesus says, I am Jesus who, whom you are persecuting. And so Saul, at this point, is rethinking his worldview. He is struck blind, and the mighty Saul, you know, the disciple of Gamaliel, one of the great you know, Jewish rabbis at the time, uh, the wealthy Saul, the educated Saul, the visionary, the man who is you know, incredibly type A, powerful, he is led like a little child by the hand into Damascus, where he sits for three days completely blind. Makes you wonder what he was thinking about during those three days. Well, during this time, another Ananias, not the one in Acts chapter 5, but a different one, gets a message from Jesus, and Jesus tells him, I want you to go see Saul, and Ananias kind of freaks out. He knows who Saul is. He knows that he's a killer, and just imagine being in Ananias' shoes to have to go and talk to Saul. Well, he ends up leading Saul to Christ. And at that point, Saul immediately goes back to Jerusalem. He starts to teach people about Jesus. He uh, uh, is able to reach so many people that he actually has disciples of his own, according to verse 25. And so Saul, who was once the persecutor, becomes Saul the persecuted. The religious authorities threaten his life. They intend to kill him. And so he escapes to Caesarea. During this time, Peter is in Lydda, and he heals a paralyzed man. And then he raises a woman by the name of Tabitha from the grave in Joppa, which is really heartwarming to read. It says that Tabitha was one of those servants who really worked behind the scenes and had a, a serving role, someone that you know many of us wouldn't look at as you know, playing a huge, important role in the church. And yet, from God's perspective, uh, this woman was so important to the kingdom that God actually empowers Peter to raise her from the dead to continue in her work. Well, we move on into Acts chapters 10 and 11. 
We read about a man named Cornelius. He was a Roman centurion, so he was part of subjugating the Israelites. Uh, Rome had you know, put Israel into a, a subjugated state, and he was the conquering authority. He was a Roman centurion, which means that he led you know, a group of a thousand soldiers, and he gets a message that he needs to talk to a man named Peter in Joppa. And so he sends his men down to Joppa to talk to Peter. Meanwhile, Peter's in Joppa. He's on top of the roof of one of the houses. He gets a vision of these unclean animals, these non-kosher animals. And three times he gets the message that he should kill and eat these non-kosher animals. And Peter just refuses each time. Well, eventually he's awakened from this trance. And he's probably thinking to himself, you know, what was that about? What was that supposed to mean? And he hears a knocking at the door. He comes down to see that it's none other than the messengers from Cornelius. So he travels up to Caesarea. He comes in. Cornelius says, you know, I've gathered everyone together. I heard that you have a message for us. What is it? And Peter leads this entire family and social group to Christ. Well, this is so scandalous that it needs to be repeated in Acts chapter 11. Maybe you've read that chapter and just wondered, you know, why are they repeating the story? It's because this was so scandalous that Peter would go to Caesarea, the home of a Gentile, not just a Gentile, but a Roman, not just a Roman, but a Roman centurion, you know, someone who is uh, oppressing the Jewish people and leading him to Christ. Peter has to defend himself and actually explain uh, what he was doing. And he explains that, you know, this message isn't just for us. They got the Holy Spirit the same way that we did. And the Christians in Jerusalem agree with Peter. At this point, the message continues to spread. You know, more Christians appear in Antioch, in Cyprus, in Cyrene. And Barnabas, the son of encouragement, he really seems like a guy who believes in people. He picks up Saul, you know, someone that was a killer, someone that was so antagonistic, who hated Christians, hated Christianity. Barnabas believes in this man, and he picks him up from his hometown in Tarsus and takes him to Antioch, to see and participate in an incredible revival that occurs there. And this is actually the place where they stay for about a year, and this is the place where the term Christian is first coined. So Saul and Barnabas were there when the term Christian was originally uh, formed and created. During this time as well, Agabus, who is a Christian prophet, warns about this, this coming famine that's going to occur in the world, and really particularly in Jerusalem. And this becomes the impetus, the, the urge behind why Paul, later in the book of Acts, collects so much money and brings it back to the people of Jerusalem. Here is where the story gets pretty dark. Acts chapter 12, Peter travels to Jerusalem to explain what happened in Caesarea. And at that point, Herod Agrippa I comes on the scene. He executes James of Zebedee. This was one of Jesus' closest disciples, one of his inner three, you know, Peter, James, and John. And Herod Agrippa I runs him through with a sword. Just, uh, just an incredible execution, public. Just think of the shockwaves this would create in the Christian community. You know, Jesus had discipled James for, you know, three years, and he only saw James serve for about a decade. And now he's completely taken out of the picture. We see at the same time that Peter is thrown into prison. And so two of your three central leaders are thrown, to pr thrown into prison by Herod Agrippa I. Now, this is the grandson of Herod the Great. You remember the guy who was the infanticidal maniac, you know, who killed all the baby boys to kill Jesus in Matthew chapter 2? Yeah, this is his grandson. So the, the evil apple does not fall far from the, the tree here. This guy is a murderer, a killer, and now Peter's in prison. Uh, the believers just start to pray like crazy. Imagine, you know, one of your leaders is dead, another is in prison. They start to pray fervently, and God answers their prayer. An angel uh, constructs a jailbreak for Peter to get out. He gets out, he goes to the house of the believers, he talks to them, and then he goes to another place. Acts chapter 12, verse 17. Where does he go? We're not sure. We do know that by the time that Paul writes 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 1 and chapter 3, that the Corinthians in Corinth, Greece, in AD 55, they know of Cephas, Peter. 
So sometime in that decade period, you know, from AD 44 to 55, Peter makes his way to Corinth. But other than that, we're not quite sure where Peter goes. At this point, Herod travels to Caesarea, and the people venerate him. They worship him as a god. They start to, to call out to him that he's a god. And the book of Acts says that he drops dead. God gives a judicial punishment to Herod Agrippa I. And at this point, I think it would be tempting for modern readers to read this and to say, well, this just sounds like a legendary, a cruel, you know, the, the author probably wanted to show that Herod Agrippa died. Why? Because, you know, he killed one of God's guys, you know, James of Zebedee. But the idea that he would be worshipped as a god and drop dead, you know, that just sounds kind of like it was made up. Well, not so fast. We read about this not just in the Bible, we read about it outside the Bible from the uh, Roman Jewish historian Josephus. This is from his book, Antiquities of the Jews, book 19. He says this, Herod's flatterers cried out that he was a god. Upon this, the king did neither rebuke them nor reject their impious flattery. A severe pain also arose in his belly and began in a most violent manner. And he said, I, whom you call a god, am commanded presently to depart this life. When he had said this, his pain became violent. Accordingly, he was carried into the palace. When he had been quite worn out by the pain in his belly for five days, he departed this life. And so here we see that this was not some kind of a legendary accrual, but that in fact, Herod actually was worshipped and fell dead. Well, what happens at this point in the account? We see that Peter went off to another place, that James is dead, that James, the half-brother of Jesus, becomes a central leader in the early church in Jerusalem. And at this point, we see that Saul, who later becomes Paul, and Barnabas are going to begin their first missionary journey. In our next session, we're going to show you Paul's first, second, and third missionary journeys. And this is where it's going to get really good. Uh, we're going to get into the, the history, the geography, where they went, when they went there, uh, you know, where Paul wrote his letters, the culture of these places, uh, look at some of the archaeology that's been uncovered. And so I hope you join us for our next session as we get in deeper to our virtual tour of the Book of Acts.